I was researching the subject of psychedelic substances in nature, and I was interested to learn what many people have observed, that the molecular structure of many of these chemicals is slightly similar to that of serotonin. And of course, the experience of these substances has similarities to serotonin as well, and sometimes they interact with serotonin receptors. Serotonin in the brain, it could be argued, is a substance that helps ease us out of our desire to pursue what we've been pursuing, because it tends to be released in the body when we've reached the goal we were going after, and so have to switch gears in the way we're relating to the world. Instead of pursuing an imagined desire, we now need to stop pursuing and engage with a palpable reality. So if internal chemistry like this is a good guide for what we need to do when, for our own benefit, then perhaps the psychedelic chemicals that originate outside the body but have a similar effect on our brains are equally as accurate in guiding us appropriately when found in their natural context. So I'll give you some indications as to why I think that's the case, but I'm not a biologist. So this video is just me sharing an idea. And if you're qualified in this area or know anything about it, maybe you can tell me if it makes sense. What I'm essentially suggesting is that animals in nature can read their psychedelic states as a reliable map of what to do where for the greater good, for the stability of the local ecosystem. And if that's correct, then because the substances match the pattern of animal behavior to the pattern of a local need, these psychedelic relationships would form an important modular layer of moral perception in animals. They would change how animals felt with changing environmental requirements, a bit like an interspecies language of compulsion. Um, these chemicals would guide us animals through a codex of feeling states on exactly what to do where for the good of the environment. So it would be like turning up in a place and being able to mentally tune into what the ecosystem wanted, as though you had an external nervous system that connected you to your surround. And this way of relating would also be far more intelligent than anything rational thoughts could surmise, because this would be forged through the generational empiricism of natural selection. So it's clear that psychedelics modulate the behavior of susceptible animals. And if they didn't do it well, if they changed the pattern of animal behavior in a way that made the animals clash with the pattern of their situation, then those psychedelic relationships would be destructive and would fail to be selected for. So instead, to be successful, these relationships, whose components have been around independently for different lengths of time, need to come together and crystallize in a way that makes behavioral changes that they induce beneficial to both of the species involved in the exchange. Now, sometimes there are casualties in this, um, because although it doesn't seem to happen to mammals, individual insects involved in psychedelic relationships sometimes actually die and the process is helped by the psychedelic substance. So what I'm saying is really true on a species level. Wherever there's an established psychedelic relationship like this between uh, fungi and animals or plants and animals, it's always working to invoke behavioral changes that benefit the overall health of the two species that are involved. So in the instances where individual insects die, it's probably because the population is too high in that area and the numbers need to be reduced to keep the species in sync with its environment. Or if it's not that, it'll be something similar to that. You know, there'll be some kind of balancing explanation. So is this true for humans? Did our psychedelic experiences keep us safe as a species in the rainforest and on the savannah? Well, certainly you could argue there's a pattern that indicates this is the case. But before we get to that, let's just quickly revise this important switching action that happens in the brain. Let's say the brain has two metaphorical modes that it switches between. And I say metaphorical because it's much more complicated and nuanced than this. But, you know, as a metaphor, there's pursuit mode made of rational calculating thought that leans heavily into the default mode network. 
And then this stay here and engage mode, which involves cross brain connections that will widen our range of instinctive peripheral acuity. So the stay here mode fires up instinctive rather than rational styles of awareness. So in everyday life, a hormone like ghrelin, the hunger hormone, will put us into pursuit mode by increasing our inclination to engage in rational thought that will lead us to food. And in this state, you'll notice the other style of awareness is fading. So when you're hungry, you're not interested in the scenery. You know, if your friends are joking around, you're not as present to engage with them. You just want to find food. Once you've found food, however, dopamine and serotonin, amongst other things, ease you out of this rational calculation and desire to pursue and your range of instinctive peripheral acuity starts to expand again and you feel more connected to your surroundings. And this is why there's a link between heightened states of pleasure and genuine peripheral acuity. You know, it's why a good meal sometimes feels like it equals the universe. It's why a connection with lovers and friends makes the world seem solid and meaningful and instinctively legible somehow. You know, that feeling where everything makes sense, but you couldn't exactly explain it to anyone else. Well, similarly, our inability to get that style of engagement with us around when we're hungry or lonely or generally depressed is incredibly helpful as well because it injects a dramatic sense of urgency in our desire to get what we're missing. This helps orient the rational thinking pursuit mode gives us towards achieving the specific goal that will alleviate our specific and instructive feelings of lack. So that's why there's a slight switching action between pursuit mode and stay here and engage mode because the absence of one helps to strengthen the intensity of the other. Now, psychedelics do a lot more than, say, stay here. The stay here component is possibly coming from the fact that they reduce our ability to worry, basically. But both groups of stay here chemicals, the ones that originate inside the body and outside, curate a different style of instinctive relation in accordance with what's needed in that situation. So oxytocin says stay here, but it says stay here and bond with this person or this creature in your midst. Melatonin says stay here, but it says stay here and relax and fall asleep. Serotonin says stay here, but it's like stay here and engage and be happy and alert and vibrant. And the same is true for the external psychedelic drugs. Marijuana has a different message to DMT, which has a different message to psilocybin. And interestingly, you can feel those similarities in the external chemistry to the internal hormones. Studies that I'll list below have shown that there's an instructive feeling of oxytocin-like kinship and love for other living things like plants, fungi and animals that comes up in psychedelic states. And I would suggest this looks suspiciously map-like. Because if we had those feelings that intensely all the time, it'd really help us steer ourselves away from behaviours that harm the environment. In normal states, if we're honest, we know we shouldn't engage in convenient but destructive behaviours and yet can't seem to stop. And we have to realise this is due to a literal perceptual impairment in our relational intelligence. We're failing to perceive how we need to behave to survive long term. And that's an effective disability. So these psychedelic substances are possibly helping animals relate in what you can only describe as an intelligent way to their situation, itemizing what needs to be preserved and protected in an animal's environment, ultimately for its own good, by engendering feelings of love towards these items. This is why psychedelics constitute an important part of moral intelligence. So internal and external chemicals tell you to engage with different styles of relation that are ultimately all written into your own DNA. But it's a bit like ghrelin switching on hunger. These styles of relating are otherwise dormant within your perception. So they're invisible until they're activated by a chemical and it's, you know, psychedelic perception comes as an incredible surprise to us because we just don't even know it's there the rest of the time. 
and for various reasons I'll address in future videos, the way we wire our own brains through language and conceptual thought builds up the default mode network, particularly in infancy and adolescence, and I suspect it atrophies the more cross-brain networks. So that impoverished circuitry, um, which you can build up again using meditation, struggles to make sense of what you experience if you ever take a psychedelic substance. The other problem is if psychedelic drugs are like a feeling map of their area, then we don't take them in their natural context. So if you feel great in a London basement because you've taken psilocybin, actually that signal is not instructive of how you should be feeling. It's not relevant to what you're doing. So it's a style of delusion. You know, that had only been selected for to be accurate if taken in its natural context. If we recognize that in order to be selected for, psychedelic experiences do pattern match our behavior to the needs of the environment in which they arise, we can be assisted in making sense of what they're conveying to us. So in my mind, the medium by which messages are conveyed is a medium of signals. It's not necessarily a medium that's telling you about, you know, your hallucinations are real. It's a, a signaling medium, but the message in order to have been selected for probably has some truth to it because it's correctly guiding animal behavior to do something that that area wants, which is why we can notice religions seem to be based on these altered states instructions. Um, but obviously, again, psychedelic states in the UK are illegal. I'm not advocating the use of these drugs. So let's return to that question. Have psychedelics that we've evolved to be responsive to actually guided us successfully into behaviors that helped us survive on the savannah? Well, funnily enough, the safest place to be on the African savannah is next to a large group of big animals like cattle, you know, because any wandering big cat will pursue them before it'll pursue a group of humans. And this just gives the humans more of a chance to defend themselves and a greater chance of surviving an attack. Cattle are also our food. So if you're camped next to a food supply, that's the, the right way to live on the savannah. I don't advocate the consumption of meat, but you know, there's no denying it was a necessity when we lived on the savannah. And funnily enough, one strong psychedelic relationship that has been selected for involves humans and psilocybin mushrooms that grow on the dung of cattle. So us being told to stay here next to cattle effectively, I would say is an indication of this psychedelic map theory in that, you know, there's no agency involved. It's just coming from the fact that because that message worked to keep both species alive, it was selected for. If, on the other hand, we encountered other magic mushrooms in a place where we couldn't relax, we would have developed something like a vomit mechanism against them. You know, if the first tribe of humans to eat them gave in to their stay here chemical and relaxed in an unsafe area and were eaten by predators, then only those members of the tribe that were allergic to the mushrooms and vomited them up would survive to have descendants. So soon the whole human tribe would vomit up that particular mushroom upon eating it. So when you encounter that vomit mechanism, which frequently accompanies uh, plants and fungi with psychedelic components, it's a slight indication that perhaps it wasn't worth your species building up a tolerance for this organism. It benefited them more to remain repelled by it. Now, we can see evidence of an interesting evolutionary U-turn in our response to dimethyltryptamine, or DMT for short. This is a chemical from plants that also works in our brains to induce the strongest of all psychedelic experiences in humans. And yet today, it only works if you can get it past your blood-brain barrier artificially by smoking it or injecting it. So we seem to have developed the ability to read it at some point in our history, and then we've developed a blocking agent in the stomach, monoamine oxidase, that stops it from reaching our brain when we quite commonly ingest it in plant material. Well, if DMT used to say, stay here in the forest, that would be a good signal to follow, because in that context, it's saying stay here next to the fruit of trees that sustained us, 
we'd get the fruit, the trees would have their seeds transported and fertilized with manure. So that's why that was selected for, perhaps, and why we have that dormant circuitry today. After moving to the savannah, however, the DMT we found there came from trees that didn't supply fruit in the quantities we needed. And so for those humans who continued to read DMT's stay here message, they would have lost their rational ability and felt sated and relaxed in the wrong place before garnering enough nutrition to sustain them. So some kind of blocking mechanism at this point needed to come in. It wouldn't be the vomit mechanism because we needed to retain uh, the nutrition from plant material available on the savannah. There's much less there than there is in the forest. So instead, the blocking action of MAO in the stomach was the perfect solution. You could retain the nutrition, but just block that relax chemical reaction. And what amazes me is how specific these relationships might be if, if this is the case, if this is the way it works. Because I notice cannabis, for example, says, stay here, but be careful. You know, so it makes you feel good and then says, do you think that's a predator? Are you sure that's not a predator? And so on. So I presume, you know, without needing to look it up, if I was to take cannabis's word for it, I'd say, you're very good for my species, but you grow in a place where there is the odd threat. I can tell it's something. So so what do the fungi and the plants get out of these interactions? Well, what are animals for? They're for transporting seeds, spores, and soil nutrients in the form of manure. And that's the primary meaning of life. If anyone's doing anything else, I, you know, I don't know if you got the memo, but um, the rest is pointless. So stay here chemistry that talks to mammals like us does seem to come up in places where manure is uh, actually needed more than it otherwise would be present. So alcohol, for example, is the product of yeast feeding on sugars of aging fruit. And if fruit actually has long enough to age and rot then maybe there aren't enough animals in the area to eat it. And if there aren't enough animals, then the soil won't be well stocked with the manure that would make the tree that's actually bearing the fruit continue to grow healthily. And you won't have the seeds and spores that animals carry, and that keeps the ecosystem functional. So the stay here message of alcohol in this situation has been selected for because it happens to grab passing animals and talk to them much like a potential suitor in a bar might talk to you and say well oh, what are you up to do you fancy staying here for a while what are you doing well you were pursuing something weren't you oh come on mate that's not all it's cracked up to be come on mate sing us a song and you stay there for a bit by keeping us there um the chemical relationship garners the manure i'm talking about the fruit now, not the potential suitor So that sorts that problem out. It can't just upset the stomachs of passing animals because doing so would cause them not to eat rotting fruit after a while. But if it makes the process enjoyable and relationships like this are only selected for in areas where susceptible animals can relax and everyone's a winner, you know, and this relationship continues. In the case of wood rotting fungi that contain psilocybin, I wonder if the aim is just to recruit extra animals to dilute the rotting wood with manure to help integrate it back into soil. Saying stay here to passing insects who are susceptible will retain extra chewing power and stamping power, which is all needed to digest and break down rotting wood. And it's just like the body recruiting extra materials to a wound. A space of decay is like a negative space which needs to be changed to make it readily fertile again. So why aren't these altered states all more like our experience of being drunk? You know, it's quite believable that alcohol is saying nothing more than stay here. But magic mushrooms and DMT, they say a hell of a lot more than that. The deities, the moving geometry, the loss of all self and all reality. I do think there are logical explanations for all these things. I'll tell you about the geometry next time. Um, (laughs) I could be on the wrong track, of course. You know, I'm not a biologist. So in all seriousness, this is just to share some, you know, patterns I've noticed, some ideas and I hope you can um, scrutinize what I've said intelligently. Thank you. You know, I'll repeat what I said at the start. 
you've got to f- abide by the drug laws of your area. They're illegal because we don't understand fully what they do, but they're so powerful. If you like these videos, please subscribe for the ones that follow. And thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you next time.